All right, today we're looking at uh, Acts 25. So we've been going through the book of Acts, we're up to Acts 25, and uh, there's three lessons I want us to draw from Acts 25, which we'll go through as we go through this chapter. Now, in Acts 25, we see now Paul's trial under Festus. So Festus took the position of Felix, which we saw in the last chapter. And we can see here in this chapter the difference. You'll, you'll see the difference in how Festus deals with the situation versus the way Felix dealt with the situation. And we see here Festus was indeed more noble than Felix, even though Festus unfortunately was not a believer either. So let's, uh, let's go through these uh, verses and we can uh, draw some lessons from it. So Acts 25.1. Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So remember Caesarea is where Paul's being kept. This is where Felix and now Festus was governor. And now he's going to Jerusalem to go visit. And he is obviously speaking with the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council here in verse number two. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him. So you can see that the Jewish leaders are trying to deal with, you know, the, the new governor to try and, you know, remember what their plan was. Their plan was to try and get Paul to come and be judged by them and then, you know, ambush him and kill him in the way. So even two years later, so you remember Felix detained Paul for two years, even two years later, there's so much hatred that the Jewish council had towards Paul. Paul was causing so much trouble even two years later. You think two years later they're kind of like one man, you just forgotten about it. You know, think about two years in your own life. Two years ago, I mean, probably forgotten about what was even happening. It feels like so long ago. But here, they are still plotting to murder Paul and desired favor against him. So who are they desiring? They're desiring Festus. So they're trying to talk Festus into saying, well, hey, Bring Paul back to Jerusalem so we can try him here. But the Bible tells us what their true motives were. And desired favor against him, that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying in wait, laying wait in the way to kill him. Verse 4, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly thither. So Festus does not oblige them, right? Because we see here, as, we, as you read through Acts 25, you can see that Festus is quite, even though he's not a believer, he's a Roman, he's quite a principled man. He's trying to follow, he's, tr he's a bit by the book, like, no, well, why are we bringing him to Jerusalem? He's under Roman jurisdiction. He should stay at Caesarea, and that's where he should be judged. So you see how he's not like Felix, where Felix is just trying to please the Jews, and he's uh, trying, to, trying to straddle so much. He is actually trying to do what's right by Roman law. And even though they beseech him to bring him to Jerusalem, he's like, no, he should be, should be at Caesarea because that's where he's, he's being tried. And, he's, and then he says to them, let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man. Remember, they already did this under Felix. And now he's saying, well, the right thing to do is if you want to accuse him, that you guys should come up to Caesarea. And maybe Festus doesn't know that they've already tried this. Right? Come and, and accuse him. So they, they obviously give this another shot. Said he, uh, verse 5, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And when he tarried among them more than 10 days, he went down unto Caesarea and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. So do you see here the difference between Festus and Felix? So Festus, he upheld the law. Felix used the law, do you remember, in an attempt for personal gain. So remember how he was using the law to detain Paul, but then he was calling Paul and communing with him often. Why? Because he was hoping to receive some bribe of Paul. He was hoping to receive money. So Felix was like the ungodly leader, using the law to his advantage. Festus was trying to do the right thing by the law, even though he was an unbeliever. Now, not only that, remember Felix delayed judgment. You know, for political expediency or to keep in, in, in good graces with the Jews, he kept Paul detained. Whereas Festus, as soon as he got back to Caesarea, look, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. So as soon as he went back, he then dealt with Paul. So we see there the difference between 
Festus and Felix. Now, this is what I want you to think about here. Even though, think about now Festus versus Felix, but then you have even Festus versus the Jews. Right? Festus was not a believer, yet he at least lived consistent with the principles that he stood for, that he believed. And then you contrast that to the Jews in, in this chapter, the, the Jewish council, who are, the Jews were given the oracles of God. They were sent the prophets. They had the truth of God. And yet here they are plotting to kill somebody who is preaching the word of God. They, they want to commit murder. So you see this contrast here between somebody who doesn't even have the truth and yet lives by their principles, and then these people that have the truth, they don't believe the truth, and yet look at the way that they're behaving. Romans 3, 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So the Jews had an advantage in the sense that they had the truth in their possession. Unfortunately, they didn't believe it. They didn't live by it. And here you have the contrast in Acts 25 of somebody that's not even a believer, yet living a life that is more principled than the ones that have the truth. Now this reminds me of the story in uh, Jeremiah 35. I don't know if you know the story of the Rechabites, but we'll go through this chapter because I think this story is kind of relevant. I won't spend too much time here, but we'll just read through it so you can see what this story is. But it really reminds me of the principle and the lesson I want to draw from this first part of Acts 25. Jeremiah 35, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jaz Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. So God is telling Jeremiah, invite the Rechabites to the house of the Lord, and offer them wine to drink. Right? And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdal, Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Mas Messiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. So Jeremiah does as, as he was commanded of God. He invites the Rechabites and sets pots of wine before them, gives them cups, and says, drink ye wine. But they said, we will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us. So, so first of all, it's not wrong to drink wine, just so, so you can see here, because he's obviously offering, God is obviously telling him to offer them wine. But look at how the Rechabites, when they are invited to drink this wine, respond. It says, but, but they said, we will drink no wine, so why do they refuse the wine? It's not because it's, it's sinful, right? Like some people believe. Why? For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commander. So they called the Rechabites, but Jonadab was a son, so he's like one of the fathers of the Rechabite tribe in terms of a son of Rechab. Our father commanded us. So he's given a, he's established a tradition amongst the Rechabites, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons, forever. But that's not the only tradition that he, he established, Jonadab, son of Rechab, established for the Rechabites. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents. So one tradition he set for the Rechabites as well is you're not even allowed to build permanent dwelling houses, you guys are going to be a nomadic people. Like you're going to live in tents. That ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice. So these are the Rechabites that are in the temple that are being offered. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters. So you see, it's not just drinking wine. They, they didn't eat grapes at all. They didn't plant vineyards. They didn't even build houses. Well, these guys lived in tents. Nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. So I'm assuming that the Rechabites, they're just they're, uh, shepherds, you know, they're just animals. 
right, as opposed to they're, they're not uh, husband. For we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. See, so they're saying, we're not going to, we're not having this wine, even though it's being given to us from God, right? And Jeremiah is saying, hey, or well, Jeremiah is following God's commandment to offer them wine. And then they give the reason for why they're refusing this wine, because Jonadab had given this, set this tradition, that they don't have anything of the vineyard, of, of, the, of, the, of the grape, and they don't build houses. But it came to pass, when Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land, that we said, come and let us go to Jerusalem, for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, and for fear of the army of the Syrians, so we dealt, dwell at Jerusalem. So the Rechabites are saying, well, this is why we live here, because when king of Babylon came, we fled, and now this is why we're in Jerusalem. Now here's how God now ex explains the situation, right? Commends the Rechabites over Israel. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? So you see how they're not rebuked for, because God didn't command them to drink the wine. He commanded Jeremiah to offer them wine, right? So it's not like they're, they're disobeying God. And it also shows that this tradition that, Re that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, set for the Rechabites was also not sinful because they're commended for keeping that tradition. But what's the point that God is making here? God is saying to Israel, ye, will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, see, the Rechabites are obeying their father's commandment. And he's saying, but you don't obey my command. That's what God is saying to, to the Israelites. For unto this day they drink not, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you. So he says, notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you. Rising early and speaking. What is he referring to here? He sent the prophets, he sent the word of God. But ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you, to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people have, have not hearkened unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he hath commanded you. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab shall not want a man to stand before me forever. So you see how he commended the Rechabites. He says, there's always going to be a Rechabite that stands before the Lord because they obeyed the voice of their father, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, to not build houses and not do. But he's contrasting that to the fact that Israel is given commandment by God and yet they're not keeping it. Now why does this, let's go back to Acts now. Now, why does this situation in Acts remind me of this story of the Rechabites and we can apply it to ourselves today? Because I think it's a shame that many Christians today are less knowledgeable, less committed, less obedient, less passionate than the false religions of this world when they have the truth. You see, like we, have, we are like the Jews. We've committed our, you know, the oracles of God. We have the word of God. We have the truth. And yet Christians that have the truth are less committed, less knowledgeable, less passionate, less obedient, less bold than even those of the false religions. You know, like the Muslims, the Jehovah. Look, think about the Muslims and how bold they are in their faith to the point where they change suburbs. They change suburbs to like, you know, 
shops in Bankstown. They, they, they need to all sell halal now. Why? Because that's how bold they are in the things that they believe. What about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons? You know, look how, look how faithful they are to door knocking and preaching the gospel. They're out there. You know, that's why when we go door knocking, we go soul winning, everyone thinks we're Jehovah's Witnesses. Isn't that a shame? Isn't that a shame when the Bible-believing Christians go out and then they are accused of being some false religion? Surely it should be the other way around, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it be God's people? And they say, hey, they are like God's people. But yet, that's a shame, isn't it? So like I see here in Acts 25, it's, it's a shame that Jews that have the truth when being compared to Festus who has not the truth, and we'll see later in Acts 26 when we get to that, he is like mocking Paul for even, you know, thinks Paul's crazy, the things that Paul is saying. And yet here he is living a life more principled and more noble than those that have the truth. James 1.22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So what's the lesson I want us to take from this first part of the chapter? You know, live a Christian life that excels beyond the vain dedication of those that believe in the false religions. You know, let's not, let's not think, okay, well, we've got the truth, you know, and, and, this is, and this is what people don't like about once saved, always saved. Right? So, you know, we don't, I'm not saying people aren't saved if they live this way. Yeah, but let's not be like this. This is not good. You say, oh, you know, we've got the truth. Oh, it doesn't matter. I live because I'm saved anyway. Yeah, but does that mean... You should be less committed, like I said, less knowledge, less passionate about those that, that believe in the false religions. No. You know, we, as believers in God's word that have the truth, the true children of God, the Bible-believing Christians, we should be trying to live a life that even excels in dedication to the false religions. Why? Because we have the truth. So let's not just be hearers of the word only, deceiving our own selves. Let's be... Uh, doers of the word. So live a Christian life that excels beyond the vain dedication of the false religions in this world. All right, let's go on to the second part of the chapter. Second part of the chapter, we see Paul appeals to Caesar. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints about Paul, against Paul, which they could not prove. So again, this happened before under Felix. It happens again. I think this is the reason, this may be a reason why Luke does not rehash what is actually said here, because they're probably just bringing up the same things, trying to you know, accuse him again of the same things, but having another bat at the stumps because there's another governor that they can try and you know, curry favour with to condemn Paul, at least convince him to come back to Jerusalem. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. So Paul just outright denies all the accusations, says they can't prove it. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? So I don't think <clears throat> this is Festus just sort of kowtowing to the Jews. But, you know, as a governor, he is trying to keep his people happy. There's nothing wrong with a governor trying to, you know, keep them happy. But he's trying to keep them happy within the law. So he's asking Paul, well, do you want to go back to Jerusalem? You know, because he knows that's what the Jews wanted. He doesn't know that they're doing that in order to kill Paul. But Paul does know. Remember, because Paul, when he was in Jerusalem, you know, and he was kept by uh, Claudius Lysias, just trying to bring him out so that they could kill him. And then that's why the whole reason why is in Caesarea. So Festus says, hey, do you want to go back? And... Um, go back to Jerusalem and be judged. But then obviously Paul shuts down this attempt in the next few verses. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar." So again, we see here, Paul, do you remember when he was bound by Claudius Lysias? He says, hey, can you beat a Roman uncondemned? Again, we see here, Paul not being ignorant of his rights as a Roman citizen. 
So he appeals unto Caesar, knowing full well that this is how Roman law works. And then you read about Roman history and all those things. They, they had this sort of escalation where he could appeal unto Caesar. And then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. So Festus, as we see, being a sort of by-the-book type of person, he appealed unto Caesar. He had to oblige to that. He, didn't, he couldn't bring him back to Jerusalem like he knew the Jews wanted because Paul had appealed unto Caesar. Now, what I, what, I, what I want to share with you here, as I think is interesting, is now in Acts 23, if you remember back two chapters ago, do you remember Jesus appeared to Paul? And what did he say to Paul? And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, the reason why Paul goes to Rome is because he appealed unto Caesar. So now you've got to ask the question, would he have gone to Rome anyway had he not appealed unto Caesar? So Jesus said he was going to go to Rome, but then would he have gone to Rome if he didn't exercise his right as a Roman citizen and say, I appeal unto Caesar, and that's what brought him to Rome? Well, this is the great mystery of, you know, how God works the many free will choices of man to still accomplish what he has, what he wills, right? Now, this, this is very similar to the story of Isaac and Rebecca. I don't know if you know, knew this. So let's go, because I just wanted to compare, not, not compa they're not, the, 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 the events of the story are not the same. What I'm saying, this principle of God willing something and, and yet the free will of somebody made it happen. And then it makes you wonder, would it have happened if that person did not do that? Like, would Paul have gone to Rome? Or did Jesus always know that Paul was going to appeal unto Caesar and that's why he went to Rome? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that one out when we meet Jesus and we can ask him, how did that work? Genesis 25, 21. So here's the story. I, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So remember, Rebekah was barren. She was barren for 40 years, I believe, off the top of my head. It was 20 years or 40 years. Isaac prayed for his wife and then God gave Rebekah children. Not only one child, gave her twins. And the children struggled together within her and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. So, you know, Rebecca, like, like a lot of people that go through trials, you know, they don't always understand why God has given them a struggle. But obviously the struggle is here because there was, these were the fathers of two nations. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people. Who are these two? You know your Bible? Isaac gave birth to Jacob and Esau. Esau later called Edom, where you get the Edomites. Jacob was given the name Israel, and everybody knows who Israel is. Two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And look at this, and the elder shall serve the younger. So God at the beginning said there's two nations, but the elder is going to serve the younger, meaning Israel will rule over Eden, right? Eden will serve Israel and not the other way around. But then you have these two other events. Jake, Genesis 25. Jacob sod pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob swear, said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So his birthright as the firstborn he sold. And the Bible says he sold his birthright for a morsel of meat. So that's one event. What's the other event? So the other, one event was Jacob basically, you know, selling, tricking Esau into selling his birthright 
for a pottage of bread because he knew he was desperate for food. You know, he was a good negotiator. He was a good negotiator. <laughs> Genesis 27, 6. Here's the other story. This is when Rebecca tricks Isaac into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. Rebecca spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy brother, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth, and thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. So we'll skip over down to Genesis 27, 35. So, you know, she knows that at this point, because she overhears Isaac saying to Esau, go and catch your venison and make me meat that I love, that I can eat, and then I'll bless you. And she hears that. So she says to Jacob, her son, you know what, I just heard that Jacob's going to want to eat some food from Esau and bless him, so let's... let's deceive him and then get, get that blessing. And he said, so this is after he eats Jacob's food and blesses him, now Esau comes in, he says, thy brother came with, subt came with subtlety. So now it was actually the mother and the son colluding together, and had taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob, for he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? He's talking to his father Isaac. Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. And all his brethren which I have given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? So this here in Genesis 27 is where we see the prophecy given to Rebecca, of two nations will be in your womb, the younger shall serve the older. Now it makes you think. If God had not told Rebecca, two nations are in you, the younger shall serve the older, would she have deceived Isaac? And in deceiving Isaac, she fulfilled the prophecy that the younger shall serve the older. Now which one was it? Well, like I said, like, you know, because God is outside of time, we don't really see how he operates. We know man has free will. We know man has choices. But yet God can work all these things to accomplish his will. And I see the same thing happening in Acts 25, where Paul was determined to go to Rome by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet would he have gone there had he not appealed? So what is, what is the lesson here? This is Romans 8, 28. The Bible says here, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So this verse, most people would understand as, you know, we make all these choices in our life and sometimes things don't always go our way. Maybe we make the wrong choices and maybe we, you know, are in unideal circumstances. But to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, God will use those unideal circumstances and good will come from it. And God's good will and his good purposes will be accomplished that he so desires to achieve. So what is the lesson I believe here? Is submitting to the will of God does not mean that you do not do what you can do with the things within your control. So we still, we always have a response. Paul had a responsibility to preach the gospel. He had a responsibility to not be ignorant of the laws of the land that he lived in. He had a responsibility as a Roman. He had a choice as a Roman whether to exercise that right and say, hey, I appeal unto Caesar. But what God wanted to accomplish, was, which was he wanted him at Rome, he accomplished at any rate. So just because God has a will, that doesn't mean that you don't fulfill your responsibilities, you don't do what is within your control. So that's the lesson there. Submitting to the will of God does not mean you do not do what you can with the things you can control. And we can apply this to areas of life like a job and a marriage. You know, obviously God wants people to work, God 
God wants people to be married, but then, you know, do you just say, I don't do anything about it within my control? No, you still, you will still train yourself up. You will still learn. You will still apply for different jobs. You will still go looking for a job, but yet God will bring you that open door. And it's the same as well with marriage. You know, you don't just sit back and do nothing to try and find a spouse. You will still, you know, improve yourself. You will maybe learn, gather some skills of communication, go and expose yourself to like, you know, different communities and whatnot. And then, you know, now the opportunity will come. All right, let's go on to the last bit. Last bit it was a bit quicker because we'll go through this one a bit faster. Acts 25, 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. Now, I don't think Paul would have known that this would have been the case. And would Paul have known that while being detained in Caesarea and then two years later, He's detained by Felix, and then he's brought again to, to, to trial under Felix, and then King Agrippa comes, and this conversation happens between Festus and King Agrippa. Does Paul know all this is going on? He doesn't. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, so King Agrippa visits Festus, and Festus goes, you know what? Hey, there's this guy, Paul. There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. So now he's just recounting the story to King Agrippa. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die, before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. So this is why he's saying, hey, he should be kept at Caesarea, come and accuse him. So you can see here that Festus, being sort of a you know, more noble man and being by the book, saying, hey, you know, he's saying to King Agrippa, but it's right that, you know, they're accusing him and they want to kill him, that they should, he should stand trial. Therefore, when they were come hither without any, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth, against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none occasion of such things as I supposed. So he says, when I heard the case, it just wasn't what I thought like you know that this guy's innocent but had certain questions against him of their own superstition so this is where you can see now festus is just not a believer at all i mean he's saying well these guys it's according to their superstition you know, he's talking about the, the jews religion and jesus christ like it's feng shui you know it's his superstition and one jesus right so he doesn't even know like who jesus is he's just saying and there's this jesus guy which supposedly which was dead whom Paul affirmed to be alive. So Paul is saying this guy Jesus, according to their superstition, was killed, but he's alive, and that's what they're disputing over. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. So you can see that Festus there actually had good intention because he's like, well, back there, they actually know more about this superstition and all these things, so why don't we go there and actually talk about it back in Jerusalem? But you know, obviously we, we know that they had other plans. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. So just a quick point here on, on, this, on, on this, this part of the chapter from 13 to 21. We talked about this in the last few chapters of Acts, but you know, just the importance of having a good testimony as a believer. Right? Because our words and deeds leave an impression on people which can lead to more opportunities to witness. And we see here Paul's boldness, his respect, the way he's speaking, obviously left an impression on Festus where when King Agrippa visited Festus, he says, you know, there's this guy, you know, and, and he brings his case before King Agrippa. And what did that lead to? That led now to King Agrippa saying, you know what, I want to hear this guy's story. I'm intrigued now to hear what this man has to say. But we know, you know, King Agrippa, he was actually quite knowledgeable about these things, right? Where we see Paul trying to convince him in Acts 25. But the point here is Paul was a good testimony of a believer. And think about this. When Paul was brought before the Jewish council the second time two years later, we still see Paul having the same spirit. You know, he wasn't more belligerent or anything like that. 
I mean, what a testimony of a believer who is detained for two years, going through a trial for the name of Jesus Christ, and yet two years later still shows the same respect to the next leader, Festus, who's bringing him again out for another trial. I'm sure Paul just sees this as another opportunity to preach the gospel before kings and governors, as Jesus had said. So this is Colossians 4. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. So you know Paul's writing letters to all these churches while he's in bonds, so he's reflecting on, hey, I'm here to preach the gospel, pray for me, so that when the opportunity arises, I'm ready. So here we see, two years later, he's now given an opportunity to now preach the gospel before Festus, which has now led to an opportunity to preach the gospel before Felix and many other nobles, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Here we see Paul practicing what he preached. He said to them, hey, pray for me, so when I get an opportunity to preach the gospel, I'm ready. And hey, let your speech be your way with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And here he's behaving himself wisely, as David did, and it's given him an opportunity now to preach the gospel to Festus. But not only that, preaching the gospel to King Agrippa. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. Now you would think at this point, or maybe he would just invite Paul for a dinner with King Agrippa and Festus and have a bit of you know, Bible study over the kitchen table. But no, that's not what happens, right? On the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Benice, with great pomp, so they put, on a, they put on a gathering, was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city at Festus's commandment, Paul was brought forth. So he goes, you're going to hear him tomorrow. We're going to get everyone to come hear Paul's case. Now, as a Bible preacher, somebody who's on trial for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, could Paul ask for a more a better opportunity to preach the gospel. Like Jesus said, you're going to preach the gospel to kings and governors. God has set this situation up for Paul to preach the gospel to not just King Agrippa, but to all the nobles of the city. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying, that he ought not to live any longer. It makes you think, Paul's acts led to this situation. Doesn't it also make you wonder? I wonder if the prayers of the Colossians also created this situation. Because he was saying to the Colossians, say, pray for me, that a door of utterance may be opened unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. And he says this in Ephesians as well. So the Ephesians are praying for him, the Colossians are praying for him, and here where he's bound, look at what happens. He's given the opportunity. When I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. So, in, so God is using the situation in Festus's mind. He's thinking he's appealed unto Caesar, but how can I send him to Caesar when I don't even know like, what, what he's actually guilty of? So he's... He has, this situation has been brought forth to use this situation to actually find out what is this man actually guilty of. So he says, after examination, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not with all to signify the crimes laid against him. He's like, I don't want to send somebody to Caesar. And the Caesar's going to ask, well, what am, I what am I hearing him for? And he's like, I'm not even sure what he's guilty of because the accusers don't even have any evidence. And that's where the chapter ends. Chapter 26 then goes on into Paul's presentation to them um, in Acts 26, and we'll go into that when we go into 26. <clears throat> but let's just go to Matthew 10 again. 
Because this is really the situation that Paul is living, and we've, we've talked about this a few times. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Isn't this what Paul is doing? You know, could he have just gone back to Jerusalem and just, but no, he's being wise as a serpent. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues and ye shall be brought forth before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So what is the lesson here? You know, this is great opportunity that Paul was given to preach the gospel to kings and governors and all the nobles of the city. He had to be ready for that opportunity. So they prayed for that opportunity. He thought about how, you know, he should speak. But he had to be ready, like the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we have to be ready. What if Paul was delivered up this great opportunity and he didn't know what to say? He's like, oh, I think I've been in prison. You know, I haven't, I haven't really kept up with my preaching the gospel. I've been busy. You know, I've been working. You know, Paul's in prison, but just insert any other reason people give for why they haven't kept up with you know, the work of the Lord. And then they're not ready when the opportunity presents itself. Now, your opportunity may not be like this with the pomp and King Agrippa and Festus and all the nobles, but your opportunity may be a friend at work. Your opportunity may be somebody you sit next to on the train. Your opportunity may be, you know, at a family dinner, you know, a relative says, oh, you know, I've been looking into this, like, you know, I'm just interested, tell me a bit about it. And you're like, you're not ready, not ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So the lesson we can take away this last one is always be ready to preach the gospel because you never know when you'll be given an opportunity like Paul. So in conclusion, three lessons from this chapter. Remember, live a Christian life that excels beyond the vain dedication of the false religions of this world. And I would love God to say about this church that you know, there's no, nobody more dedicated, nobody more knowledgeable than you know, the church in Liverpool. You know, they, they have the truth and they excel in the truth. Number two, <clears throat> submitting to the will of God does not mean you do not do what you can with the things you can control. Yes, God can control, control some things, but you have a responsibility. Now, do we know where God's will and your responsibility meet? No, we can ask God about that when we get to heaven. But we see here, just like we saw with Rebecca, <clears throat> just like we saw with Paul, we just, have an op we just have a responsibility to do what's right and we'll leave God's will to do the rest. And the last one is, always be ready to preach the gospel because you never know when you will be given an opportunity to preach the gospel to a captive audience like Paul did in Acts 25. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your word <clears throat> and we pray that this uh, example from Paul we will follow after. Lord, help us to always be ready. Help us to excel in our Christian life. And Lord, help us to always take responsibility for the things that we control and leave the rest to you. We thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus and we pray these things in his precious name. Amen.